Hi everyone, welcome in to the box seat for week number two. Yes, a big thank you to our stable of sponsors. Without them, the show simply wouldn't be possible. And it wouldn't be possible without the NZTAB either. A big thanks to the personnel who have helped us uh, put the first show together and allowed us to use the studios uh, right throughout the series. Michael Gearin's with me again. Uh, Michael, magnificent week of harness racing we've just completed. And this week has major connotations going forward to the major week, the second week in November. Yeah, hi Greg, uh, and hi to everybody who's taken the time out to watch us. What a great Friday night it's going to be at Addington. It feels like one of those meetings we used to have in the old days where there's good open class racing, age group racing, but really, really deep support races. Greg, it almost feels to me like the harness racing season road to the cup, which has been quite long already, actually starts this week. And Greg, there was a massive speed bump on that road to the Cup at Alexandra Park last week, which has probably left some punters feeling a little bit confused. Yeah, we'll get right into that uh, very shortly with the Spring Cup. A little bit of feedback. We asked you uh, to send us feedback, and we got some from uh, Neil Davis from Form Pro. What he was asking, Michael, was with the use of Pure Direction and Stride Master, how much do we factor it into uh, when we're doing our form and selections for races? I know myself doing some work for Addington Raceway, we have, we have a thing called uh, the Stride Master Standout Stats, and I'll go through all of the races and uh, try and pick out uh, a couple that have you know done things that perhaps to the eye or to the result uh, aren't there. What about for you? I know the Big Fish uses uh, the Pure Direction site quite a lot. Um, do you factor in uh, the sectional timing that is available? No. Okay. Funnily enough, I, I never do, Greg. I, I stopped using a stopwatch about 18 years ago and it actually coincided with my first winning year as a punter. I started to just look at the horses. I, I work out the fact that if they're coming home in 56 off the front and the horse is making ground from the back and therefore is coming home in 55, it's faster. But, but to me, 55-3 and 54-9 are the same thing, depending on how far you get pushed off the track. One thing I'll say about punting, Greg, and, and Neil does a great job with all his sectional stuff, is that you've got to go with the partner you took to the dance. If you're a person who believes in looking at your eye and trusting your horse or trusting form or ringing trainers and doing all those things, you can't just then change your mind because of sectionals. And if you are basing predominantly your uh, picks on sectionals, you can't then change your mind because a trainer says something. So I think everybody who punts or tries to take race analysis seriously tends to use a certain system. And I think that system really works for some people and I think it can be important. It's not uh, in the top two or three things I look for out of a race group. All right, uh, boxseatnz at gmail.com if you want to send us your feedback or ask a question like that. Uh, Alexandra Park, great supporters of our show. A couple of features out of there on Friday night. Let's start with Krug taking out the inaugural New Zealand Bloodstock Harness uh, Million. Get Aaron White to bring them home and then hear from the co winning trainer in Nathan Purden. Unleashed through on the passing lane and BD Joe, it's all about faith. Krug drives very hard, 75 to go. NZ ZB, Standard Bread Million, and Krug tears away for a champagne victory. Krug wins by four. It's all about Faith BD Joe. He stuck on brilliantly for third. That was pretty definitive, Nathan, and he looked a better horse this week than he has the entire time he's been in the north. Yeah, obviously, um, it's hard to say, Mick, he's, uh, he's raced good, but uh, you know, this week he, he really thrived um, from race to race from last week to this week, and uh, yeah, we lifted his work and, and he sort of raced accordingly tonight. Isn't that the, the key to the better's delights? You can give them that extra work and they can cop it. Yeah, they just seem to bounce off the, the last race so well, and uh, being a cold, he carries a lot of condition, um, which, you know, that wasn't, that, um, you know, that's a big help from, uh, from coming off a race, and you know, his confidence was at an all-time high, so uh, no, he he, um, he showed it tonight what he can do. Were you at all concerned when your dad crossed you out of the gate with It's All About Faith? Yes and no, he's, he's a very good horse, but uh, you know, he can over-race, and you know, he just looked like he did over-race tonight, which uh, probably took the toll on him in the end of it. OK, it's been a busy time, and it's about to get busier, but heading south. I take him, he goes home, has a few days off, then when does he go to a sire stakes heat for the three-year-old version? Uh, well, we, he'll go travel home on Sunday, so uh, he'll arrive home Monday, uh, probably have the rest of the week off, and then and then bring him back up, and he'll sort of tell us when he's uh, when he's ready, whether he takes 
three weeks or, or five weeks whether he uh, to get ready. But no, he's he's got a little bit of time under his sleeve, but uh, you know, he'll come around pretty fast. Then there's a return trip here for the sales series three-year-old version on New Year's Eve. Or is there any consideration to heading to Australia for a Breeders' Crown? Yeah, it was in the game plan um, originally. Uh, just with the with everything going on, it's so hard to get over there ourselves. Um, but to uh, yeah, we haven't ruled the idea out, but probably at this stage leaning towards the size. What does it mean for your career? Because you've always had to carry the big name around, and you've had plenty of success, but now you're part of a big stable, and you've got a very good horse. Yeah, it's. Uh, I've been lucky. We we're uh, you know, working for Dad early days, and you know, I got to work with very very good horses. Um, and you know, this guy, uh, you know, he's he's every bit as good as the ones I've driven. Chrissy's on board now as your training partner. That must be a, a different dynamic to, to having Cran yapping around the place all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's no, good. It's uh, Chrissy's good. Yeah, you know, we uh, we all working well, and yeah, you know, we've got a great team around us. So uh, that's what you know, that's what it's all about. Well, he was the benchmark two-year-old Michael, and he's come back at three. Yes, he got beaten last week, but once the barrier draw, he came up with one. He took a trail uh, in behind. It's all about faith. It was very much a replica of the Young Guns final back in March, and he exploded up the straight to win by almost four lengths and a complete domination in the end. Yeah, quite remarkable when you think that these races were basically put back about four or five months, Greg. I think pretty much the same horses who Quinella this and trifected the week before probably would have ended up in the same positions had we run these races back in May. I don't know that, but they seemed to be the top horses back then. Maybe first class was one horse we didn't see come through to this series, but predominantly uh, I think we've seen the same horses dominate. Interesting comments there from Nathan that that better's delight thing with Krug because you can get to the bottom of them. When he thought his horse wasn't quite at its peak, he dug deeper and got more out of him, and I think that's what we saw. I think we saw a far better version, Greg, of Krug last week than we saw in the previous couple of weeks. I thought the second horse was really good. He's just run into a very smart all-round race horse. And I think BD Joe's been the big improver out of this crop, Greg. And American Dealer's another horse who's embellished his record because he's come from a second line. So those three, maybe adding in BD Joe as number four, Greg, uh, quite away in front of the others, I thought, over the course of the last two big races. $155,000 yearling purchase out of the New Zealand bloodstock sale, uh, of course. And going back to that size stakes of last week, the whole field were purchased out of the sale. So by better's delight, at a champagne princess, the wonderful breed of the late J.W. Smolensky. Second of the features, uh, I actually, the consolation is what I wanted to talk about, Michael, because the performance here of Luke John never looked the winner at any stage when a very similar time to the, uh, the final one by Krug and the Hollis Roberts and, and that Hulahi combination got the business done here. Look, Greg, I, I can't remember a horse winning at Alexandra Park who was less likely to win in the last five years than this. At one stage, he was eight lengths detached from the second last horse in a four-horse race and just wouldn't go. I spoke to Tony Hulahi about that, and he said, look, he just didn't know what to do. He's quite new, and he was just mucking around. But I didn't want to pull the plugs too early in case he didn't come back to me. Tony was really impressed. This is a nice horse for Logan and Shane. Part of me hopes they can sell him because I think Logan and Shane own about a third of the horse. Part of me wants them to keep him, Greg, because on that run, 239, mucking around, there's no doubt he's probably a derby horse, but I'd be kind of surprised if he's still living in New Zealand by New Year's Day. Yeah, it was a great way to start uh, the night. Uh, that feature for the open class paces, most expecting Copy that to continue on his winning way. It was uh, the Franklin oh, Roofing God, Spring yes, Cup of 2020. We'll get to Aaron out. White to bring yeah, them home and then hear from up. winning co-trainer and Barry Purden. As Mark Shard goes now to on the cards, Bella Montana through on the HR Fiskin passing lane. Bella Montana, the only mare in the Spring Cup and Mark Shard copy that late. Mark Shard is back. Mark Shard, his New Zealand Cup campaign might be right back on track with a Spring Cup win. Well, Barry, that was a bit more like it from Mark Shard. Yeah, it was, uh, Mick. Yeah, a bit of a relief, actually, but uh, we are really thrilled the way he went. What have you put the performances so far this season down to? First up wasn't too bad. Since then, he's looked like a V8 on about six cylinders. Yeah, look, 
It's hard to put your finger on anything, Mick. I've always been pleased with the way he's worked. Um, he's, the only thing, he, he's hung on to his old hair, his coat, he's still got a wee bit of it, and he's just starting to let it go a bit now, and he's starting to look a bit better, so I just think we went through a bit of a stage with him, but, you know, he worked great on Wednesday, and I, I wasn't getting too carried away, because obviously he's been, a you know, a wee bit disappointing um, as well, so it was just a great relief to see him do what he did tonight, because he, he burned a bit early too to, to get his spot, and, and to stick on like he did was, was, was pretty meritorious. Had he sat in the trail with an easy run and one like that, you might have thought to yourself, well, that's OK. But to work that hard early and do that job's a big run. Yeah, it was. I mean, the times was fantastic from a stand. And, uh, yeah, I was just thrilled to ease back, Mick. You know, it just makes it so much uh, but much of a relief. Yeah. What's the plan with him next? I, I presume he's coming back for the Homes DG. And then do you consider Ash Burton or would you like to stay closer to home? I think we'll just stay up here, uh, Mick. I think it's just sort of a bit different now. Uh, and he's got races here, so and then we might just um, either consider the cup trial or um, and then go into the cup or, or just um, you know stay up here for another race, perhaps. Yeah. OK, your other two, Bella Montana. I thought she had been only OK so far this season, with no luck. Tonight, far better. Yeah, well, the first start, she went great, and she ran second to copy that. Uh, yeah, a couple of little flat starts the next two but hey she went good tonight I think she might have even hit the front halfway down the straight and just 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 got a wee bit tired but hey she's only mirror in the race and they're pretty damn good horses that she was in against tonight. Will she be in the New Zealand Cup all going well between now and then? Well she's still in Mick at this stage I, I think well we'll just see close to the time you know I, I, we might be better just you know waiting for the mayor's races or hanging around up here but we'll have a talk to Dean and just see what he'd like to do but you know, uh, if she did start in it, well, you know, and things went wrong, well, Zach could always look after, I know that, but anyway, well, there's a little bit of time to go yet. On the cards, doesn't have those Mears options races being a boy, so I presume the cards are go for, the cups are go for him? Yeah, I think so. Mick, he, he's actually trialled good, and I guess he's gone not too bad tonight, uh, you know, considering what they went, so he had his chance, but um, he wasn't far away, so I guess we'll, move, we'll press on with that too. Well, Ray, I'll put it to you simply. Were you surprised by that? I thought with the trip he should have won. To be fair to him, probably another few strides than he would have. Um, but not in the way I expected him to with that kind of trip. So I can only put it down to um, the, the trial he had last week was very soft. Um, he's probably got away a bit on us. Um, Morris said he didn't feel 100% round the corner. He got pushed out a little bit but I'm I'm looking for lame excuses now so I'd just say that um, he was probably a little bit short for this tonight. Wasn't much fun for the punters but not much you can do about that. He might have learnt something though because he did just seem to crab at the top of the straight and get a little bit unbalanced. Yes he um, he wasn't 110% tonight gate wise. <clears throat> in the past he's been a problem in that regard but um, he's been good recently up until now sort of thing so um, uh, we'll we'll be looking into that. Where next? Uh, probably the, the home CG in a couple of weeks and then obviously we'll we'll head south. Well he's always been a good horse Mark Shard of course he won the Young Guns final runner-up in the Inter-Dominion. Uh, look he got the right run Michael and his cup campaign as Aaron White quite rightly pointed out is well and truly back on back on track. Well it is but I'd sort of not given up on him Greg but just wasn't sure what was going on with him. We, we know how good he was he ran second in an Inter-Dominion and of course won the Casey Classic last year won a group one as a two-year-old. When the campaign starts this poorly for a horse, you have a lot of concerns about him, but that's the great thing about this being a longer New Zealand Cup campaign. Barry Purden, as we heard there, um, was able to get him back on track, and, and the horse started to turn that corner on Wednesday. I think Greg heading forward, he's a legitimate chance in a New Zealand Cup at least each way, because he's run second in an inter-dominion to a horse who's not going to be there, so really good to see him back uh, on track. And Bella Montana, as we heard from Barry, at least at this stage, still heading to the Cup. But Greg, the questions around uh, copy that, I think 
he's only having his fourth start in open class, and because he's so good, we just expect him to win all the time. Maybe those chinks in his armour mentally were exposed there, just going roughly and looking unbalanced at the top of the straight. I'm not at all put off his New Zealand Cup winning chances, but because he was beaten after having that run, Greg, he just has to fall down the pecking order, whether it's only from first to second, and whether he should have been first in the first place in the market, I'm not sure, but it definitely puts some doubt into your mind about how he may, may react under intense pressure over two miles on Cup Day. Yeah, certainly off the markers. And uh, the other horse that made up a lot of ground, uh, sectionally was the best in the race, was Star Galleria. Spoke to Stephen Reid about him. He said, obviously we're back on track, but um, you never quite know with this horse. They haven't made a decision whether the New Zealand Cup is absolutely uh, locked in. He will go round in the Holmes DG, and I guess the decision will be made uh, from there. Let's have a look at the rankings, the first set of rankings brought out by... Uh, the New Zealand Metropolitan Trotting Club out of Addington Raceway and of course Cruz Bromax ranked number one Michael because of uh, his win in the race last year this is brought to you by IRT of course and um, there's probably not too much to uh, be concerned about in regards to those rankings uh, maybe the Trotters one when we get there will be slightly uh, more controversial. Well, well Greg the rankings come down to a criteria so you can't actually argue with the rankings because they're based around the criteria you may well want to argue with the criteria for example, the most jarring horse there is Gambit. You look at Gambit and go, well, how is Gambit in the top 10 horses in the country? And, and maybe he's not. But because he won a Group 3 race last year, well, he jumps ahead of all the horses, like you may collect, who haven't won at that level before. So you've got to have some sort of criteria, otherwise somebody at the club just gets to pick the field, and that's probably not the right way to do it, and people don't know how close they are to getting a start. What you do find with both galloping and harness is over a period of time, the right horses end up in these races, Greg. Trainers are smart enough to pull the wrong horses out. Uh, I think we'll end up with the right type of field, but that criteria is set, and therefore the rankings sort of fall into play around that, Gregory. It's not just a case of people saying, well, we think this horse should be here. They've got to be ranked somehow, and they've got plenty of time between now and cup time, Gregory, and plenty of races to win their way up the rankings. So, yeah, two different things there. Rankings, yes, but they are based on the criteria. That's the key word here for both the trotters and the paces. Yeah, and you're right about Gambit. He won the City of Auckland uh, free for all, which I think is at Group 2 level, so that's how he made his way into the top 10. Let's have a quick look at that market and see uh, what has changed. And self-assured now, the $2.50 favourite, copy that, drifts out to three sixty, and spank him, who we'll see later when we preview the Lamb and Haywood Canada. Every classic in two five dollars. So plenty of action uh, coming up in the next few weeks around the New Zealand Cup. And of course, the road to the Cup. We go to the Lamb and Haywood uh, this week at Addington Raceway for forty seven and a half thousand through to Meth and through to Ashburton and the like. Let's move on to our feature trotting performance of the week, brought to you by Brecken Farms. Great to have Karen and Ken Brecken getting in behind the show, and this horse bolt for brilliance. Outstanding New Zealand record time. Aaron White to uh, bring them home. 244.6, the record previously held by Lamond and Dr. Hook, and he's picked up a pretty fair horse here in Temperale. A very good four-year-old strolls up on the outside of Temperale. Oh, how good is he? Bolt for brilliance. Sensational win running down Temperale. He got home in 55 and 27 too, and he's picked up a good one here, Michael. Yeah, well, Temperale is a four-year-old won a road cup. You would have to suggest Bolt for brilliance at least is as good considering we're in September. And by the time he gets around to May next year, God willing, there'll be a road cup in May next year. How good might he be? He's throwing down the Gauntlet Gregory to Ultimate Stride and Cracker Hill, both of whom I think are very special horses. They clash next week, and we're hearing that Ultimate Stride will have Josh Dickey in the sulky because Matty Williamson's going to be suspended. Gee, that's going to be some good racing, but I'm not sure they're any better than him, Greg. I think maybe Cracker Hill's more professional. I'm not sure that's also the case right-handed. There's so many things in play here. The one thing I did get out of Tony Hurley he is he wasn't nominated for the Dominion and he won't be late paying and there's no interest in the Dominion or the free-for-all for Bolt for Brilliance. So he'll be sticking around up here, Greg, and when you think he's only four 
all those races over Christmas in the north, plus the jewels, which have been confirmed for Cambridge next June, plus all these age group races running over from the three-year-old season. Man, this is an exciting horse with a huge buffet of options. He has, uh, by muscle, who had a too much to do. He's won half his starts, and he has home ground advantage. Uh, the feature out of Banks Peninsula on that Sunday, of course, was the DG Jones Memorial Cup, and uh, this one was taken out by this very progressive type in one Apollo, and uh, he did a great job in Martua front, Tana Michael, because it was a really on. windy day. Matua Tana did what he can do, rolled into a gallop, and heavyweight hero made very good ground up late, but he's a smart horse, one Apollo, and he's beautifully handled by Ricky May. One Apollo, heavyweight hero, one Apollo, heavyweight hero, one Apollo, one Apollo won the group three, beat heavyweight hero. That wasn't easy for him. You can even see there, Michael, with him, the way the camera's moving, uh, just how difficult it was with the wind, and he had to cop running into it a couple of times, so it was a brave performance, and Brent White's done a terrific job with him. He's arrived in open class, no doubts about that. Isn't it wonderful to see the little man Ricky May and the gold helmet home in a, a group race again um, after knowing that maybe there was a chance we were never going to see that again. The sectionals around this horse have been really good since he's come back this campaign and now he's an open class horse, Greg. I think you factor him into a Dominion, you factor him into a trotting free for all if they go there. He should be sticking around in the grade for quite some time. Not at all disappointed by heavyweight hero. I thought he was good. I also think he's probably going to be more potent against the marker pegs because it wasn't an easy day to come wide. And Matu Atana, Greg, I think, think, if he had stayed down, he would have won. What do you think? Yeah, well, I've said, seen that a few times, though, Michael. He just has that ability to roll into that gallop. and um, He's an enigma. He's got the brilliance. But, uh, yeah, uh, one Apollo was able to starve him off and then heavyweight hero. That moves us on uh, to the Majestic Sun Dominion. And uh, the rankings, of course, are out. So let's have a look at those. Abibi Inter, who won the Banks Manitula Cup last year, four of the last ten winners have gone on and won uh, the Dominion following that. The big question around the rankings, Michael, were those uh, three-year-olds, now come four-year-olds, uh, of uh, Cracker Hill uh, and uh, the other of Phil Williamson's uh, runners, where they sit in the rankings, 19 and 20, but you've already talked about uh, the fact that it had to be ranked on, oh, the, the way the, the criteria is, is uh, based on form in open class races, and those horses clearly uh, haven't started in those, and, and therefore they have to put them somewhere, and that's how they've ended up 19 and 20, I think it is. Look, it's really hard to make a case that if you're not winning derbies at three, and we didn't have any, so they couldn't win derbies at three, that they can have group one form. Now, they have the chance to get some form out of these four-year-old races coming up at Alexandra Park. In your mind's eye, and to everybody watching this show, you look at, did you bring the Bears or a horse like that, and you go, well, how the hell is it ranked above Cracker Hill? because we know Cracker Hill's a better horse. But did you bring the Bears ran third in a Group 1 on Cup Day last year? So he's got that form on the board. The other form we think is going to happen, and we know it's good enough to happen, Greg, but it hasn't happened yet, and that's no different to the rankings for the Melbourne Cup. Again, it's a long road, and these horses have the chance to embellish that record, and, of course... Um, you have horses who are going to drop out of it. A horse like Did You Bring the Bears, if he's not going good enough, the connections almost certainly pull him out of the race because a hard two miles affects these horses so so harshly. So, Greg, I think we'll probably end up with the right amount of horses, I just like the right horses in the race, but we can't just have a criteria where we think horses are good enough and we rank them in the field because that would mean all the open class form from the previous season became largely irrelevant. Yeah, that's right. Ultimate Stripe was obviously the other horse I was talking about. And, uh, yep, they'll work themselves out, I'm sure, as we build it towards the big week, the second Tuesday, or the second uh, week in November. As we go to a break, though, another performance from a Woodlands runner. She's no lady. Of course, she took out the delightful lady at two. She bounced back with this winning performance last Friday night. To the outside, it's Texas Tiger and Amnuni. They lead by two now. Picking a path through Ponies Happy Place down the outside, Jack Ryan. They're followed further back as She's No Lady starting to thunder home. It's Texas Tiger. Now Happy Place is driving hard. Happy Place and She's No Lady. Oh, that's very, very tight. Close enough to a dead heat.
need to head out to Addington Raceway. They got an opportunity to catch up with their CEO, Brian Thompson, last week. Uh, Michael Guerin asked a couple of questions, and here is the answers. It's exciting. We're building towards the New Zealand Cup. Six weeks out. I think it's your tenth and second as the boss. So um, this is what you're in the job for. Yeah, we're pumped that it's level one. We're all excited about getting through to, to Cup Day um, and, and Show Day as well. Look, under level one at the moment, we've had a few changes. Um, that's basically we've just reduced numbers in both Lindau and Public probably around about 30%, and that's just to give people a bit more area. Um, also hospitality, that's probably 20% less. But to be honest, ticket sales are going great. So we've probably got one area in hospitality, that's Christian Cullen Lounge, and also we've got um, probably, ticket sales would be ahead of last year for both Lindau and Public, so they will sell out, and we won't have any available on the day, so you have to pre-register. Yes. So we're all excited. So you're not threatening people, but what you're saying is you need to buy your tickets because it will sell out. Oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah. You know, Canterbury's in a need for a party. Yeah. Um, and we see Cup Week as, it's always given the opportunity for people to dress up and celebrate with friends and families, and you know, we see that as our responsibility to put a great event on and let people have some fun. All right, Brian, you've got at least three sets of plans. So level one, we know where things are at. Talk me through if we're in level two and or three. Yeah, level three is quite easy. We'll be racing behind closed doors. Level two is a little bit more tricky. We'll probably have pods of 100, uh, maybe nine to 10. But we just want to assure that our main priority will be the owners, will be the members um, and a few sponsors. We won't be having any public on site on that day or Lindau or hospitality. Just to put it in perspective, under level one, we're planning on sending out about 1,200 owners tickets and up to about 1,400 members. So given the fact that we probably only have 900 to 1,000, there will be people that will miss out. But we'll come up with some options. There might be some members, just members with no guests. Owners, we may restrict on a couple of owners per horses. Um, but we'll definitely try and get as many people as we're here. Could be another option as a ballot but we're trying our best to get them here to have and, a great day. And if it's under level three, give confidence to the people at home. If they do purchase a ticket, it'll be a full refund. Oh, 100%. Any, any ticket that uh, we sell before then uh, will be refundable, and also under level two, if they can't come along, it's refundable too. The IRT New Zealand Trotting Cup, great to have uh, Richard Cole and his team in behind it. And nominations, uh, I know Brian Rabbit was pleased, and I'm sure you were too. Oh, definitely, they're the same numbers as last year. It's great, we've got the uh, Cruz Bromac back from Australia, and being Australian myself, I'm pretty um, excited by that, um, but yeah, I, I think it's going to be a great day. I know we're going to get a chance to have a chat prior to uh, the big day, but you know, congratulations on putting together what you have so far, and I know you're looking forward to it. Yeah, we are, and, and thanks for your support for the box seat as well. It's great to be able to communicate to people, and thanks to all our sponsors, including IRT and Majestic Sun. So great to get that update from CEO Brian Thompson and we'll attempt to do that in a couple of weeks time uh, just depending on what happens I guess in the world of COVID. Speaking of Addington Raceway who also get behind uh, the show, a couple of features out of their last Friday night. It was the Sire Stakes uh, prelude and Leaf Stride continued on his winning way. Let's see how he did it and then hear from his trainer Patrick. Phil Williamson. Leaf awaits on the run, 29-6 third quarter, bit of muscle yet to be called upon a length and a half. Leaf Stride with the inside run. Wide out, Son of Patrick, then out of my way. Bit of muscle, two lengths, Leaf Stride. Son of Patrick keeps coming. 120 to go. Bit of muscle, a length and a half. Out wide, Son of Patrick's coming to him. And Leaf Stride, the far side. Bit of muscle, Leaf Stride coming quickly. Son of Patrick wide out. They hit it. Leaf Stride. Leaf Stride won it. Beat Son of Patrick. Bit of muscle, third. Well, that couldn't have worked out better. No, it was uh, sort of... Uh how we'd hoped the race would be run, Greg, and it turned out that way, so it was nice to get a, a trailing run and a bit of experience into him. Nice to see him early too, good early speed. Yeah, yeah, no, he's just got that nice natural talent, so that's, that's a, a good weapon to have. Going into the prelude, you were hoping to get a bit more ring craft. He would have learned a lot tonight. Yeah, no, it was really good for that because he, he hasn't had much experience. I mean, two races and uh, only a couple of trials, so no, everything... Everything was great tonight. Right, you've got a couple of decent targets in the next two weeks, and on that performance, a little bit more confidence on picking. Uh, well, yes, we we definitely know we're in the in the in the hunt with him, Greg. But there's a few nice horses in there that where the runs are pretty important to it. We got the good trip and the good run, so uh, you know, just a bit of rub of the green, and we're a chance. You also know that 
It's not too far away from him getting into the paddock, which I know you're looking forward to. Yeah, well, he's such a big overgrown fella, and he's he's come a long way. He's had a, a you know quite a number of issues over his life so far, and uh, it could be all uphill here from here if we look after him. We've got an intrepid reporter, Stacey White's her name. She's from Woodlands, of course. Great to have them supporting the show. And we got her to head out to Mark Jones's barn to find out about some of the really good horses he does have, uh, most notably stylish Memphis. We wanted to find out what the plan going forward for her was. She's had a pretty good prep this time. I mean, she's done a lot of miles and um, yeah, she'll, she'll start speeding up a bit shortly. And she had one trial last week. Ricky was happy with her and... Probably with the limited races that she can start in, she'll probably just troll until the Neville are heat on about the 8th or 9th of October. And two weeks later, she gets another heat. She'll draw the outside, but she's already won the heat, so we're qualified and probably look for the South and Oaks and main aim the end of October. And then two weeks leading into the Neville are, the timing is pretty good in those races every two weeks. So um, hopefully, we'll be tuned up by the end of it. You've tasted success in the Neville Hour Phillies final before, winning it twice as a driver, I believe, and also you got second with Stylish Memphis, full sister, delightful Memphis in 2017. So a win as a trainer, and it would mean a lot to you? Yeah, it would. Yeah, when a group one with a trainer is always good, and um, yeah, it's probably good for the, the family. Wayne's run second to Purdens every year with uh, delightful Memphis, and this one seems to be doing the same with Amazing Dream. But it's good me, it's coming along. You know, Duns have got some nice ones in that, and... But, you know, she's a pretty good, pretty good filly, our one, and it'd be great for the family and, and especially for us and the owners to get a group one with her and horse probably deserves it, deserves it. Definitely does deserve it. And then after that, have you got any plans going forward for her? Is she staying in New Zealand or she look to go back to Australia? Uh, yeah, we're probably the same as trainers with all the nice mares in New Zealand. We're pretty limited to what we can race and, you know, everyone with a mare looks at the Queen of Hearts and it's only really one race and then after that we've got nothing, so... Whether we head to Australia with her in the new year is the only other option and whether Mark takes her back or we go ourselves, we'll work that out in time. But to be fair, like America probably looks the place for her to be. Um, you know, sister went up there and won about 400000 and this filly's younger and better and probably win twice as much. So financially, I think you probably could see her in America sooner than later. Just the lack of races. The, the, you know, Princess Tiffany's a perfect example, I think. You know, she's probably finds one or two races a year and other than that, she's got to take on the free-for-allers. And it's too hard for the mares to do that. And... They need to address it urgently and um, it just shows you Addington have been having good mares races lately and they've been good races, they've been well supported and people look forward to them so they should be opening up to the, the better mares and get, get them racing here because you know the big race in America, they're filled up by New Zealand mares and they're the best in the world so um, if we don't address it there'll be more and more in America and as I said probably our three will be heading up there pretty shortly and the returns for the owners will be great but they don't want to send them there but they've got no option. Running on, Lady. Yeah, Plutonium Lady, she's come up quite good and quite a nice mare too, so she'll just head the same path as Solace Memphis, so they'll probably clash each week. And Lulu Le Mans, she's qualified for Neville Hour and head, that's probably her main aim. She's probably just a touch below the, the good ones, but she's done a good job. So they'll kind of just head the same plan, but as I said, we're all kind of, after the Cup Day, we don't know what to do with them, and Lulu Le Mans is probably in the harder boats, so unless they get races for them, as I said, hopefully they can hang around, but the races aren't there, we won't be here. And lastly, any promising two-year-olds in your barn so far that we should keep an eye out for later on in the season? Uh, yeah, two-year-olds probably a bit behind where they would be normally, but um, probably two stand out. And an art major, half-brother to stylish Memphis and delightful Memphis. He's a pretty nice... Well, he's a gelding now, but he's a pretty nice horse and probably a better delight filly of, of Woodland Studs. Probably our best filly. She's quite a nice horse and big, strong thing and well-bred and probably one that we're really looking forward to working. So that was great to get that insight from Mark Jones. She's very good, stylish Memphis, Michael, and she has a big part to play in the Neverly R final. Look, she does, but I think there's one big little problem in her way. Amazing Dream is now home from Australia. Greg, she had a very shortened campaign in Queensland. She's coming back for that three-year-old Phillies final for the four-year-old Mears at Addington on Cup Day. And what we saw last year, Greg, Amazing Dream was better than Stylish Memphis. I'm not saying that's the case, but Stylish Memphis is going to need to have improved because Amazing Dream was actually very good against the older horses over that Queensland winter campaign. All right, now it's time for us to get into the five-star meeting that is Addington Raceway on Friday night. And the key race, of course, is the Lamb and Haywood Canterbury Classic. And uh, the first three home in this guaranteed a start in 
uh, the big one the second Tuesday in November. First runner 1971, this is the old Miracle Mile, I think it was the Meadow Fresh 2000 as well and uh, now it is a very important race with a chance to go forward and of course uh, towards the Cup we have a favourite in Self Assured Michael but effectively he gives them a start this week. Look, he does. I don't see it being that big a concern, Gregory, because A, we know he's never fast away, so he's not a horse we want to be on the speed or leading under most circumstances, even though he did in an Auckland Cup. But also there's one front line here, Greg, and then he's back by himself sort of five metres behind them, which means if he steps well enough, he's just tacking onto the back of the field. I'm a lot more comfortable backing him from there, but punters need to be aware, of course, that Classy Brigade probably steps to the lead and you're giving him 12 lengths. Then the question becomes, can Self Assured give Classy Brigade 12 lengths? The answer is probably yes, Greg. Spankham's the interesting horse, of course, because we haven't seen him for such a long time. They trialled against each other last week, Greg, and I think there was enough there from Spankham to suggest he's at least on the way back to his best, but it's unlikely and impractical to think for the punters he can potentially be at that best this week. So around them, Greg, there's also a few other things in play, like you may collect returning to Addington. It's a really good race, but probably a horse who two months ago in Classy Brigade we thought wasn't going to be a huge open class factor. Now, Greg, is the horse we're going to be thinking about when we're punting in lots of these races because he might be the horse they've all got to run past. Yeah, you're not wrong. Uh, let's go to that trial you just mentioned, uh, the 23rd of uh, September. Spankham uh, started off the 40 metres with Self Assured, rolled around to the lead a lap out, Michael, and was very strong to the line. Spoke to Natalie Rasmussen about that. They got home in 56-2 and 27-1. She said he's had a really nice break. By the way, that stylish Memphis getting into third ahead of the Fixer, who of course is now trained by Regan Todd. She said he's mentally stronger. He will probably need a run. And saying that, Michael, they went 3.12 in that trial. So uh, it was an excellent time. He's had three runs back to prepare him for his first up run. And he starts from the outside of the front row. Uh, I think he's the big mover. Don't forget he got beaten a neck in the big dance last year uh, by Cruz Bromac and they went 3.56.9. So uh, he's more than capable of winning a New Zealand Cup. OK, I'll make it simple for you. It's on your home track and we know it's a massive night of harness racing there. Self-assured, do you think if he steps safely enough, which he did at the workout last week, he'll win? Yeah, I do. Yep, in okay. one, I think bang. If he, uh, so if so he does what, odds, right. what odds are you willing to take for the punters oh, watching You're this? not going to take less than $2 because he's off the unruly, but mm. uh, once it starts getting into the red, you, know, you can probably leave me out of that. Yeah, I've got... I agree. Bizarrely, I think the bet in the race may be Classy Brigade for a place, which was, was actually my bet in the New Zealand Cup last year. He's a horse who's just going to keep doing the right thing, one would think. The most interesting horse in the race is Spankham. We know the other two. We don't know what version of Spankham we're expecting, but he did win a miracle mile, beating the fixer who is back. Now, you've spoken to Regan Todd, young man who does a great job, now has a New Zealand Cup winner in the stable. What are we expecting from him? He's happy enough with him, but a little bit like Spankham, and probably even more so, um, he thinks he'll need a run. But he's happy enough with his preparation, and he seems to be a happy horse, so uh, I hope he can front up and, and deliver for the connections who have put a lot of faith in Regan, as they should, because he is doing uh, one heck of a job. We need to move on to the trotting feature. Stevie Golding, former National Junior Driver Champion's name, associated with this one, which is uh, great for him to get in behind it. And we see Sunday Sun looking to continue continue on his winning way, Michael. He's come up $2.30. Is that enough to entice you? No, but it's really hard to bet against him, Greg. The version we saw last week looked like the version of 18 months ago, where he won the Anzac Cup, he won the, uh, the Row Cup, and then won a Jules. I think he's the best horse in this crop with no Oscar Bonavina, and then, even then maybe the best version of him's better than Oscar Bonavina. Um, Winterfell's the horse I'm not sure about, but there's Majestic Man in front, and 
Look, he just smashes in Sunday's sun. Majestic Man actually gets in well this week because all those Group 1 placings haven't cost him. He's off 10 metres, and the winner here and Winterfell are off 20. But I think it's a race in two different categories, Greg. If Sunday's sun trots all the way and behaves himself, I think he'll win. If he doesn't, you then start saying to yourself, well, what do I like out of Majestic Man? Is Winterfell any chance of getting life right left-handed ever again? And then, of course, the Bibdi Int, uh, Ivy is back. Inter is back. Sorry, um, the Dominion winner from last year, Greg. He's quite a big round horse. I would expect him, with no trials, to need at least a run or two. But he's a horse much like Spankham. We've sort of forgotten about Greg because we haven't seen them for such a long time. But if we go back 12 months or even 10 months, they're good enough to win these big races. So a watch on him. Yep, definitely. He's the one I'm uh, certainly going to have an eye on. And nine horses have done the Canterbury Park Trotting Cup into the Dominion Double. And in recent times, the likes of I Can Do's it and Master Lavros have been able to achieve that. We move on to the three-year-old Phillies Harness Million and a look at the market for this one. Well, La Rose has come up favourite here. Avana, I thought, would give her plenty to think about. But gee, La Rosa was good last week. I know it was only at Maiden Company, Michael, but Mark Jones has always held her in pretty good regard and she was really strong beating Manhattan last week. She was and by no means do I mean to detract from that performance Greg but I can't believe how short she is in this market. That's remarkably short. She won a maiden race which means she got beaten in a whole bunch of other races before she got here. So that's her outside the leader Manhattan who was having only its second start. So La Rosa was really good and the sectionals stack up but I just can't cop her being favourite or a shorter favourite for this with Havana being excellent two weeks ago and Town Echo also being really good from a second line draw uh, two weeks ago having its debut for the All-Stars. I think they're at least as good a chance as La Rosa. I think this is very barrier draw dependent. In saying that, she's a horse the bookies have always kept really short. I'm not saying she's not going to win Gregory. I think it's a very even bunch of horses and it may come down to who is where starting the last lap. But for me, if I'm betting into this race, I'm backing Town Echo. Yeah, Passion and Power is one that interests me too because she's clearly better when she's in front. Well, don't know if she's as good left-handed, but uh, I reckon they'll be going forward and looking to find out. It is $150,000 after all. Michael, Cambridge race on uh, Saturday night. And great to have Cambridge Raceway uh, supporting the box seat as uh, well. To David Branch and the team, a big thank you for that. You've found a couple of winners for us. Look, it's actually a really unusual meeting. I thought it would be a daytime meeting, but it's sort of a twilightish thing. And it works really well. I spoke to David Branch about it because it's their October fest. So they've got a big party downstairs where you can go along and drink out of Cambridge Raceway embossed steins. I know, it's a true story. <laughs> and then there's going to be normal racing sort of fanfare upstairs. And then, of course, they have the Clubhouse Cafe. And what David said is, look, we're going to try these Saturday nights because we can't get many Fridays. But people can go have a beer on Saturday after that were inclined. And they can bet into the gallops as well, Greg. So what he's hoping is in Cambridge, which is a really strong thoroughbred area, if you can't make it to Hastings, you go to the racetrack, you watch Probabil and the Epsom, and you watch all the harness racing coming out of Melton, you can enjoy yourself, and if they can capture that crowd, Greg, they can keep them there on Saturday night. So I like the idea. I know very much the racing is going to be relatively second string to much of the thoroughbred action, but they're trying something here, Cambridge. So that's the big October Fest uh, night for those who feel like having a drink, which we could probably all do with after the last COVID six months. A couple of good horses here, Greg. Credit Masters off a big handicap in the trot, but he's a genuine open class horse. I think the best version of him can overcome 55 metres. And some do from the Purden Feeling Barn off a second line draw, but she's a class mare against horses who are predominantly at this stage of their careers. Cambridge horses. So credit master, some do, two to look out for having to come from back in the field, but it should be a rollickingly fun night, Gregory, um, racing or no racing coming out of Cambridge to Saturday.
Yeah, thanks for that, uh, Michael. Uh, just want to touch on the markets too. Big thanks to Matt Peden and the bookmaking team. They're getting those markets out on a Tuesday around lunchtime uh, for the features later in the week that allows us to preview on this show. Amongst those is the Graphite Developments Futurity, where there was about 54, 55 horses nominated. I spotted one. Soviet star last week's around $20. Not saying he'll win the final, but geez, he's going to be competitive, the Terry Neal trained runner. All right, with Stonewall Stud, we've been out, done a feature story on a man called Ronnie Dorr. He's a significant contributor to the industry, big time owner, and we got a chance to have a chat to him about his new setup out at Rangiora. Ronnie, before we start talking about some of your history in the game, what a beautiful setup you you got here. Yep, no, it, it's it's going good, and um, so yeah, we're doing our best to make it nice. Tell me about the inspiration to set up a purpose-built training facility, and we'll get to Phil Burrow shortly. But you must have huge passion for the sport. Yeah, yeah, I love harness racing, and um, you know we like the excitement of going to the races and winning races and. Uh, all that, so, yeah. Where, where did that originally come from? Because you were, uh, well, you grew up with uh, Stephen Woodsford, the thoroughbred trainer, and that's where the passion really kicked in. Yeah, well, Stephen's father, Graham Woodsford, he was he had some harness horses, and I used to stay at Woody's place when we were young kids, so um, we used to go off to Addington when we were 18 and 19 and 20, so I sort of, from there on, from there on, and then um, later on, uh, uh, Dennis Thompson, we were doing some stuff for Dennis, and... Um, and Wayne Ross, and so they sort of got me into it and sort of went on from there. Well, in terms of ownership, and we'll talk about some of those horses, um, you threw the 50 win barrier. I bet you it wasn't a goal when you started, but um, no, they're starting to accumulate, aren't they? Yeah, no, we, I was hoping to get one for a start, but um, we um, moved on pretty quickly, really, and got pretty lucky, really. A lot of the horses we just bought just seemed to win, so and bred, they just um, were quite lucky, I think. Best of those has been Mark's Gladiator, and, and your run with the Mark Threes and the Rock and Roll Dancers, I, I don't think anyone else has quite had the run that you've had. No, no, they just, um, we haven't had too many bad ones, so um, we've just been, just strike of luck, really. You've also seemed to have this canny knack of winning races, but then knowing when to sell. And Mark's Gladiator is a good uh, example of that. I think he won his last start at Miffin, and then you're able to move him on. Is that part of your business model? Um, no, not really. We just, um, no, it just, just depends on what's happening at the time, isn't it? But we keep some, sell some, you know. We really like to race them if we can, instead of selling them, but that's them, we'll our model race them, and um, the mares will maybe breed from them, and, and then we'll move the odd one on, but yeah, try, try and race them. Speaking of mares, a real thrill for you. Group two win in the Garrard's Premier Mares with Tango's Delight. At long odds too. Yeah, outside of the field. Gav was training that one at that time, so um, he did a great job and um, yeah, we're real happy with her. Continental Auto, another one that won a handful of races for you. And, and now we've got ourselves a mare that well, potentially, she could be anything. Wild excuse. Yeah, well, we're hoping, but yeah. So, um, we've been lucky breeding here, and um, not many would probably think a rock and roll dance out of a, whatever it will, make a deer meal would be any good, but we would, uh, there's a good, go, the family goes back good, good there, the, ex, the excuse family, so. Must, yeah, that's just an excuse, my excuse, yeah. all of that, yeah. Yeah, well, the mother's assisted are just an excuse, yeah. so it's sort of come through there somehow. So yeah, it's just lucky again. What about Cup Week 2019? Big old, big old buzz with her winning Cup Day and Show Day. Yeah, to grab the double. Yeah, that was exciting. Yeah, um, really exciting. Yeah, we weren't really expecting. Didn't even back of the Show Day, and uh, we weren't expecting her to win really. But yeah, she just sort of steps, steps up every time. So yeah, she's a very versatile mare, and she's got speed, and she's an excellent stayer. So much so. You guys have put in a nomination for the IRT New Zealand Cup. Yeah, we're just nominated at the moment and um, and um, <laughs> and um, see what happens. So, um, but yeah, we'll just just see what happens in the next month or so. She's pretty exciting, though, isn't she? Yep, yep. Hopefully, she um, can carry on and keep winning, and we keep going to keep going to the top, really, if we can. 
What about your association with Phil Burrows? And, and that goes back a wee while now. And when I looked up his stats, he's a bit of a quiet achiever, isn't he? He's trained over 200 winners, so he knows how to get one ready. Yep, he's a very good trainer, Phil. Um, sort of met him about 10 years ago. And um, so we, we, we actually got a claimer, claim to claimer, and we, went off to Anington on a Wednesday, and, and Nigel McGrath won it for us, first start. So um, sort of went from there too. You must have a lot of confidence in him to not only have him training your horses, and effectively he's private trainer, that's that's what he is now, yeah. but to invest what you are into this property, along with your other family members. Now we need to get to the Rakiro name on the outside of the property, and, and how that came about. Well, we we were trying to think of a name for the place, and my um, father came up with it. Um, so it's he's Ray, and my other brother Kevin, and me. So um, the first two letters of the name, um, so RA for Ray and KE for Kevin and RO for me. So he came out with that, so it was actually very clever, so we, we went with that. And they're racing horses with you now too, aren't yep, they? We yep, bought, we bought six at the sales and and um, we'll buy some more next year. The ability to do that is set up by your, your company, door contracting, and, and you know it's, it's a big operation, isn't it? Yep, it's a big operation, but uh, we like doing it. Yep. We like property developing and, and doing doing this sort of thing, so yeah, that's what we like doing. We and, enjoy, we enjoy it. Yeah. And, and you love your harness racing. We know it's the door contracting passing lane just up the road at Rangiora, so um, there's many elements to your investment, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, we try and um, try and um, put some money in here and there, so um, try and keep everyone going, isn't it? So um, yeah, no, we just keep, keep on going. What about the future for Rakiro, as it's known, and, and for Ronnie Dorr? What, what would you like to achieve in the sport? Or, or is it really just about having this passion and, and, and being able to go to the races and watch your horses race? Yeah, pretty well, Greg, that's about it. We just we just enjoy doing that, so we'll just carry on, hopefully get some nice horses, but, you know, um, it'll, whatever happens, happens, isn't it? But we'll just, we'll carry on, and we've got to keep investing each year, and we'll, and we'll um, hopefully get some nice horses and race them, so, but yeah, we, we just enjoy doing it, so. What about the six yearlings? Have we seen a bit of talent amongst them? Yeah, Phil seems to like most of them, to be fair. Six paces, but we've got five paces in the trotter now, so, um, <laughs> you know. You never quite know in this game, do you? No, he likes most of them, to be fair, so yeah. we'll just see what comes, comes of it, isn't it? Michael, top five paces in Australasia. We've canvassed a number of people and uh, come up with this graphic for you to find out who we believe is the top at the moment. Uh, basically, I ranked them on a, uh, or did the points on a 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Ride high comes out just ahead of self-assured. This is brought to you by Ashburton Raceway, by the way, uh, who have their big day on Labor Day, the 26th of October. And we know that clash, self-assured, copy that and the like will be there. Um, Michael, it's hard to line these horses up because clearly they're not clashing and we know the Lock and Var are the, the ride high uh, clash hasn't happened as yet but I still thought it was worth doing and a big thank you to the harness racing journalists and uh, contributors out there who uh, gave us their thoughts. Not much between those two. Now look, we've been racing in silos, so Victorian horses, New South Wales, Chicago born Shockwave over in WA, and even North Island, South Island Creek. So because of that, we can't line them up. And, and harness racing people tend to be very parochial. If the horse from my area is winning, it's better than the horses from the other area. And because we may not get them all together until the Hunter Cup or the Miracle Mile, or in fact this entire season, Greg, it's really interesting to see how you rate them. I think the best or most talented horse in Australasia is Ride High, but I don't have much data on him at the absolute top level. He goes around the smoking up at Melton the Saturday night on Trackside 1, then he'll roll into the Victoria Cup against Lock and Varad. Self-assured beat Lock and Varad twice at three, but got beaten by him twice at four, Greg. So it's really easy to sit here as a New Zealander and go, well, self-assured is better than them. The evidence last year was he's not better than Lock and Varad. 
So it's really intriguing, Greg, to work out where we think they all sit. The horse who probably fell down the rankings last week was Copy That. He might bounce back again pretty shortly. But the first of the big clashes between all those horses is going to be that Victoria Cup on Saturday week. That might work out who's the best in Victoria and a few of the New South Wales horses. King of Swing may potentially go there. And then the New Zealanders get to sort of butt heads through to the Auckland Cup. I'm just hoping, Greg, we get them all in the same place for the Hunter Cup or the Miracle Mile through February into March. Yeah, and that'll settle that uh, well and truly. Uh, speaking of Ride High, of course, he does go round in that $50,000 feature this week, outside second row. And, um, you know, this is what he has been doing, Ma Michael. His average winning margin in his last 11 straight has been over 11 metres. So he's been destroying them, but he has to step up again this week. Interestingly, we put up those uh, results from the top five amongst the nine people, including Darren Garrard, who we... Uh, uh, got to uh, chuck in his top five. Seeing Garrards are getting in behind our Australian coverage. And a horse like Cash and Flow, never even got a mention. He's won his last 12 on the bounce, Michael. Seven of those in sub-150. So he's doing a magnificent job, the former All-Stars runner, but he never even rated a vote. I spoke to Luke McCarthy, um, who is one of his drivers and co-trainer type thing yesterday. Luke said he is definitely going to Victoria for the sprint and more than likely for the Victoria Cup. Um, and then King of Swing, they'll decide on Sunday. So there's a lot of depth, Greg. But what we're having is these little mini free-for-alls all around Australasia, which tend to have dominant favourites. And doesn't mean there can't be an upset. Lock and Var Art got beaten two starts ago. Of course, Copy That got beaten last Friday. I think if you're having an imaginary race, you've got to imagine a big track, Ashburton, adding to Norman Angle, and a middle distance, 2,400 metres, probably a mobile start because the Victorians and most of the New South Wales horses, Greg, don't get standing starts. Under that situation, I'll go ride high. If you make it a two-mile standing start, maybe I would go self-assured because he's won an Auckland Cup. And if you say it's a mile around Menangle, which is a different beast altogether, well, who do you go for? King of Swing won a Miracle Mile. Spankham won a Miracle Mile. Cash and Flows won 12 in the bounce there. So I think if we're talking about the best horse in Australasia, Greg, a lot of it depends on what track, what distance, what conditions. Alexander Park goes the entire different way around. There's lots of variables come into play there, Greg. It's a fun game to play. Maybe we'll play it for real at the back end of the sun. Hey Michael, uh, we won't talk too much about it now, but show day we've got the box seat punting championship and uh, we're going to be putting a team in, you and I, supporting the Maya Foundation, uh, which is uh, their charity of the week for Cup Week. So uh, you can go head to head with us. We'll talk more about that next week. And next week, it is the Brown Pub uh, Meffin Punters Challenge as well. Go to the Meffin Trotting Club website, uh, just Google that and you'll find out all the details there. So uh, yeah, get in behind and and support that. Forbury Park this week, good to see them back Thursday night, uh, 5.05 their first of 10. Addington of course with their 11 races, 5.17. Cambridge on Saturday, 4.18 the start time, 11 there. And Timaru, yes, Farlap Raceway are there on Sunday uh, just after 12 o'clock with an 11 race card. So plenty of action Michael uh, for you to get involved. If you were having one bet this week, let's go to Addington Raceway, what would it be on? Probably Town Echo. I just think uh, the second line draw is getting you better odds than maybe you should have got. And just talking about that race, Greg, well done to New Zealand Bloodstock Standard Bread, to the Sire Stakes Board for what they've achieved. These races disappeared. They were gone. They were never coming back after last season. We kept them coming. A lot of organisation needed to be done at Harness Racing New Zealand's level. I think it's really important this has happened, these races, for people who buy horses at the sales well done to everybody involved in making this Friday night happen. If I'm having a bit, Greg, at Addington on Friday night, it's town eco for me. All right, and uh, I'll stick with Sunday's sun. That's been your box seat for this week. Don't forget to send us your feedback, uh, uh, boxseatnz at gmail.com or our Twitter handle at boxseatnz. We'll see you in seven days' time.